Welcome to Massive Passive Cash Flow, the podcast that guides professionals to financial prosperity. Join our community and let's start building your wealth. Here's your host, Gary Wilson. Hello and welcome to this week's Real Estate Investing for Professional Men and Women, the podcast for you and me, professionals, business owners, and we treat investing like it's a business because it is a business. And that's why we're so much more successful. So welcome to the group. If you're new, uh, go ahead and subscribe to the podcast. It's on a number of different channels, you know, 30 some odd channels, you know, loop of, of iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, uh, now being downloaded in almost 50 countries. And by the way, if you're, if you really want to participate in network, go to realestatewithgarywilson.com and click on members area up top. It's easy. The next page, left hand side, if you're already a member, you know what to do. If you're not on the right hand side, check it out. They give you a whole month for free just to check it out and all the material too. I mean, books, recordings on everything from Airbnb, so, you know, medical assisted living, 1031 exchange, buy with and self directed IRAs. It's all out there and you can grab all you can get during, during the next month <laughs> for free. So in any case, um, go ahead and do that guys. And then the mean, what we're going to do right now is I get into today's subject. So I got Mitch Stevens on, uh, I, I would, he interviewed me a while back and uh, we, we clicked pretty good. He's from San Antonio, Texas, but I'm going to let him tell you more about himself. And we're going to get into some pretty awesome subjects today about like uh, how you purchase, how you sell strategies, things like that. Some examples. And, uh, but for right now, uh, first off, Mitch, welcome aboard, man. I appreciate you taking your valuable time to do this, you know? Hey, we got, we got plenty of time down here. We're on lockdown, you know? So, uh, we're fixing to head to the ranch after this and just get locked down on a ranch instead of getting locked down in the neighborhood. But, but uh, yeah, I appreciate you having me on, man. I really do. Glad to do it. So let's do this. Go ahead and give, her, give everybody the, the big picture. You know, we, 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 we want all the good juicy stuff too, man. Tell us, tell us about who you are, where you are, and, uh, and, I, and I love your story. So if you could share that to start, then we'll get into some examples, you know. All right. So what I'm about to tell you. Plus seven dollars will get you a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Okay, so, <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, by a set of circumstances and fate and a lot of sweat and getting back up and dusting yourself off, I've purchased a house about every four to five days for twenty-two years. That's over two thousand houses since nineteen ninety-six in or about my hometown, not across the country, just in my hometown of San Antonio, Texas you know, and maybe the surrounding counties. But I keep it pretty close for a lot of reasons. Um, and over time, I, I adopted pretty quickly the, the seller financing strategy where I sell my, and I may be original for the most part in the country. I don't know a lot of people that do it. In fact, I don't know anybody who does it except my students, but I'm sure there are people out there because there always is. But I, I sell my house on 30-year fixed mortgages and I do not, practice selling the notes as a general rule. I mean, I have right. sold notes, I've sold lots of notes, but I sell my house on a 30 year fixed mortgage and move on to the next one. So it's a way of generating cash flow without having to be a landlord and a way of being able to um, have a, a little better picture of what your month or year is going to look like because in the rent, you collect the rent, but you don't know if it's your money or not because if the air conditioner breaks, you got to go give it to the air conditioner man. And apparently, it was the air conditioner man's money, not your money. So when you're yeah. collecting a mortgage and, you, and, and the check goes through and the deposit goes to the bank, that, that's your money. Yeah. Short of a foreclosure. And we can talk about that, but foreclosures typically turn out yeah. way better, you know. But so then I started raising private money. I became a professional. I have $24 million worth of private money on the streets right now, like nice. in San Antonio, more or less. And then I have, I had so much private money sometimes that I couldn't get it out. So I started a hard money loan company. And then I started a note servicing company because I was servicing in so many notes that I needed the $20,000 software. So I was just like, well, I'll just take on the state of Texas. And now we service like six or 700 notes uh, and growing. Um, I have eight businesses. Sometimes I forget them all. But then the other thing is, you know, I do the flips for one-time cash. I do the seller financing for temporary ca cash. And I'm quoting Jack Bosch here in, in his book, Forever Cash. And then what I do for my forever cash is, um, you know, temporary. The notes are temporary. They're going to expire. So I got to take the money I make from the flipping and the temporary cash flows 
and I got to get into something that's forever. And I, and I buy self storage units. I have like 1600 doors. They owe me about a hundred dollars a month at the Excellent. beginning of every month, you know, 160 K. Now I don't get to keep it all, but I get to keep plenty of it. So, um, that's it in a nutshell, man. I've just been for 24 years immersed in this. I did take two years off. So I've been, I always round it down to 22 years when I'm doing the numbers because I don't want to get penalized for the two years I sat down. Yeah. But, uh, but I actually had to sit down because of the burnout until I learned how to systematize. And today I can proudly tell you that I have not seen the last 400 houses I've bought. Mm -hmm. and I have not seen or talked to or met the last 400 people that bought my houses. Woohoo! Yeah. And finally I learned how to, you know, to, to make a real business out of it and become the CEO or even above the CEO. I am the owner. I have CEOs, you know what I mean? So, yeah. so that was been a trick. It's always, there's always another rung on the ladder and there still is another rung, you know? Yeah. Well, I tell you what, let's do this. Um, uh, I, I love your story. That's why I wanted you to tell it to, to show people that, you know, if you, if you simply learn, you get, you know, that's three things, the right education, the right information and taking right action. That's how you get the right results. So if, if we go go back to the beginning, if you don't mind, cause a lot of folks listening right now, they're thinking, my gosh, I, I, I want to do this. I don't know where to start. You know, I'm, I'm, we just were coming out of this, this coronavirus recession, whatever the case, you know, you know, a lot of people are wanting to do something like this. They just don't know what it is or how it is. So could you take us back to maybe one of your first couple deals that on the, when you are on the acquisition side, how did you acquire it? Did you acquire it with also no money down or owner financing? And then maybe that was one of the ones you sold later on. So start. No, the no, you're not going to believe this. Okay. So in my book, my life in a thousand houses failing forward to financial freedom. Yeah. I, I, Talk about this journey. It's a, more of an entertaining book. It's not really a how-to book. Um, this one was, people kept asking me, how did you get to this level? And I kept thinking about how did I do that? And I decided to start documenting. But I had to go back and even ask the people that I worked with, like, how did we do that? What happened? How did we get from here to there? And, and I actually had to go back and research myself to figure out. I, was, I had my head down. You know, I wasn't keeping track of anything. Yeah. I was just moving. Um, at one point in time, I learned and this was a different time, so it may not work as well or the same today, although it works a little bit, but it's not the same. Back in the day, if you had good credit you could, and you sent off for a credit card, they just automatically sent it to you with 100% of the cash advance and all the advantages of that card. Whatever the max was, I mean, there was no, there was no levels. You either you got the card with the $20,000 cash advance limit or, or not. Well, I had good credit, and I figured this out. I, 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 I sent out and got 45 credit cards, and I did the calculations one day. I had them all in spreadsheets to tell me how much cash advance I could get off each card and what the rate or the term was. And a lot of them were 0% interest introductory offers for 6 months, 12 months, 18 months. Mm -hmm. And I was making note of all this, and I bought my first 100 houses on credit cards because <laughs> also during the day, San Antonio, Texas, one of the most affordable housing markets in the world, especially at that time, you could get a decent slum house. You know what I mean? Yeah. Follow me here. Yeah. You could get a decent, majorly used home uh, for twenty-five, twenty, fifteen, twelve thousand dollars. You know, twelve thousand bucks was a, was a fixer-upper. You know, that's how we sold them, yeah. a fixer-upper. And so we put, put twelve thousand dollars on a credit card, and then if we wanted to, we put another. 10 on this card and another 10 on this card and we'd fix it up and we'd make it worth 60 or $70,000. Yeah. <laughs> well, these cards had no payments. A lot of them for X amount of months, you know, same as zero percent, same as cash. If we paid them off at a certain amount of time. And I caught on to that and it almost caused me a divorce. I mean, I was sneaking <laughs> out. I just gotten married. I was 30 days into my marriage and my wife got to the mailbox before me and figured out that we owed Wells Fargo 250,000 bucks. And she thought I was the biggest nut that ever walked the planet. But that's a whole different story. But that's the kind of stories that are in here. Like how I finagled back in, you know, got her to not leave me and stay and wait and see what happened and watch. And 
understand you, that. You should, you should have said, honey, I'm not the biggest nut in the world. Gary Wilson's the biggest nut. I'm the second biggest nut. <laughs> Mike, did you ever buy a house with one credit card? I did. I, I'm laughing when you're talking. I'm thinking, I did the same exact thing. I mean, my it, at one point, I had about a million dollars in that in that un unsecured uh, credit. I didn't realize. I, I was like, you know, I, I had to work to do something to generate revenue. I just put my head in the next thing at all. I'm getting written up in the papers, and people put me on their stages and stuff. Like, what? And I just thought everybody was doing this kind of stuff. Everybody had to work hard, but, but, uh, but yeah, that was, uh, I didn't do it all like that, but I did a lot of it like that. Absolutely. So, so, so that's actually what led to my, um, led to my banking relations, which led to my private lending relations was, um, one day I went in to get all these cash advances and I hadn't seen my high school quarterback in 15 years. Mm -hmm. And the lady at the bank said, the bank, you know, the, the president of the bank wants to talk to you because I was trying to get $30,000 off of three credit cards, you know? And, and, um, so I got on the phone and he said, yeah, this is Mitch Steven. He said, Mr. Steven, this is, it's perfectly fine, but it's a little irregular. Can I do some verification on who you are? And I said, sure. He said, uh, who'd you play football for? I like, look at the phone, you know, like I said, John Marshall fighting Rams. He said, what position did you play? And I said, I was the best tailback they ever had. And he said, who was the best quarterback you ever had? And I said, Edlin, who the hell made you president of a bank? And he said, Stephen, who the hell gave you $30,000 with unsecured credit cards? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so what happened was I was buying these houses. And, and when, before we hung up, he says, well, what is this money for? I said, it's for to buy a house. He said, oh, it's a down payment for a house. That was the different world that we lived in. He right. thought it was for a down payment for a house. No, it was to purchase the house and the entire rehab. Yeah. You know? And I said, he said, I hope you know what you're doing. And, you know, then that little high school rivalry thing kicked in. I said, you know, I looked at my phone. I said, know what I'm doing. I bet you I make more money than he does at the president of the bank. You know, I slammed the phone down. I said, yeah, okay. And so I said, I told my office, I want you to send the HUD every time we buy a house. I want you to send the purchase HUD. I want, and then when we sell it, I want you to staple the sales HUD together. And I want you to circle the purchase price. And I want you to circle the net sales amount down there and yeah. send it off to, to this bank and just put attention so-and-so. And if he's president of the bank, he'll get it. It doesn't matter what bank you send it to. Yeah. And he did. And that month I did 18 in a row. Wow. 18 that month I sent, they, they sent. And he called me up and goes, uh, you, 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 the bank wants to talk to you. Of course, I thought there was a problem because the bank never wanted to talk to me. Yeah. And then that was my first $500,000 credit line. Nice. Yeah. I tell you what's interesting is probably the same thing happened to you. Is over the years, what happened is I started working with uh, like four or five, six different banks, not to price them against each other, but because um, they had this what's called loans to one ratio. They could only lend so much money to one person. Essentially, what it means is, and I would max out. I didn't know that. I had a, one, this one bank I kept going to like every week, and they said, We can't give any more loans. I said, Well, what happened? Well, they said, You don't understand. There's a ratio called loans to one. We've mixed, reached that maximum for you as an individual borrower. I said, What do I do now? They said, Don't worry. We, got, we're all, we all know each other. Go to this bank. I had five of them I was working with like that. And uh, it, what I'm getting to is, is Mitch, is it was no longer me calling them. They were calling me. Hey, you need any money this month? I mean, it was the craziest thing, but that's what happens when you start doing this, you know. So mine was a little different. Mine, mine. Um, they gave me a five hundred thousand dollar credit line, and you know, I was. I, 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 my limitation was I didn't have money, so I was only buying eighteen houses a a, a month because I didn't have any money. If you can, yeah, <laughs> wrap your arms around that statement. Um, so then they said they gave me this $500,000 credit line, which is not a tremendous amount of money, but it was a lot of money to me. Yeah. Well, I thought I would go out and, and impress the bank. And so like by the end of five days, I had spent it all. I called Ooh. up my, called up my friend, Steven who was all excited. I said, Hey Steve, you're going to be real proud of me, man. I got all that money out. He goes already. And I said, yeah, it's all out. He goes, you spent $500,000 in five days? I said, yes, sir. I said, I got it all out. I was all proud of myself. I had my chest out. And he said, holy crap, son. He says, you're going to scare the living crap out of this board. And I said, why? And he said, well, when people blow through credit lines like that, it scares the hell out of them. I said, well, what did you give me the money for to sit there and look at it? I don't understand you guys. You guys are like the, you're, you're yeah. worse than women. I don't get it. Yeah. <laughs> 
uh oh. <laughs> you know, but anyway, it turned out to be all right. You know, what could they do? I'd already spent the money. And then I made good on everything like always. But they actually were panicked because I spent the money that they gave me on what they, I was supposed to spend it on. Right. Exactly. And they were in a panic because I did it. I, I didn't, I, I've never understood banks ever. Yeah, I know. Well, they'll, they'll, lend, they'll gladly lend money to people that don't need to borrow money. And, they, and, then, and they, I, then I ran into the same thing that happened with you. They said, we can't give you any more for a while. They want to see how things are going. Then he started, he says, but there's people that will charge you a little bit more, but they're private people. We know a lot of successful people at this bank. Let me introduce you to them. And that's uh -huh. when I got on the private money thing. And that, that has been the key to my life. Right now, I have $24 million out in the street. And this is my agreement with every private lender that I have. I have the right to pay as agreed, or I have the right to walk this deed over to you and hand you this house. Every day of the week, every minute of the day, I have that right. And that was the conversation when I sat down with them because it was a collateral only, non-recourse loan. And if yep. you don't like the collateral, do not, I repeat, do not make me a loan. Right. It's because I will have those rights. So today, you know, do I intend on giving it? You know, I know that if I give houses back to doctors and lawyers and old people and everything, that they're not going to loan me any more money. It's the end. Yeah. But, but it's within my right and I can right. hold my chin up because it was part of the deal. So right. I sleep pretty well during these times of the coronavirus and the economy. Like, as we've mentioned, we're in lockdown right now in my town for the next eight or 10 days. And, uh, but this is my chance to shine. My goal is Gary is to make every single payment, even if it costs me money, big money by people standards, because I want to walk out of this, debacle as the only guy that never called for help and never missed a payment if I can yeah you know, jury's out because we still don't know I mean it, it's it feels pretty good right now but we don't know that's right yeah well I'll tell you what so you touched on a couple things here um, uh, private money so let's talk about that a little bit because I want people to realize that you know, in any economy, there's people like surgeons that, that will lend money privately, private, private citizens like you and I, even investors like you and I. In fact, I know a bank called Enterprise Bank that was built by real estate investors. They just said, you know what, let's just incorporate what we're doing and you will, we'll, we'll get the insurance benefits and all that. We'll lend money to other investors. And I bought big buildings with those guys and they knew exactly what I was doing. But if you could talk about that, like... Um, uh, where that fits in, how people can use it. Maybe they can go through you to find these private lenders, uh, but maybe an example or a case study or just maybe the, the, the concept, you know? Sure. Let's talk about the mindset first because most people will block themselves from ever even going into this subject saying, uh, that's not me. I can't ask people. I don't know how to ask people. I, I don't know people with money. And, and, and all that is the, is the problem right up front. So, a good coach, a good course, or somebody who's in your corner, if they're any good, they got to break through your limiting beliefs. So here's the number one thing. My partner, here's a case study. My partner, Mike Powell, who I've done over 400 deals with, he's, he's 33. I'm 59. I met him when he was 25. We've been in the business about seven, almost eight years now. Um, he's a college graduate from a and I'm I graduated from the street. Um, I was, had raised this money and he had paid me to be his teacher. I normally don't teach in my hometown for a lot of different reasons, not scarcity. Scarcity is the least of it. But um, I took this guy because I found out that he put himself through college mm -hmm. with no debt and didn't have any help for anything from, from anybody for anything, not his car, his apartment, not anything. It changed my mind on this guy. So he, it, it kind of surprised me when he says, you know, I said, Mike, I noticed that you do real good when you borrow from your mom and dad and you borrow from your uncle, and then it stops right there. And you, like, there's no more private money. When you tap that, you're done. Mm -hmm. he, he said, well, uh, I said, what's the reason for that? And he, he said some answers, and we both knew it wasn't right. He was just saying something to answer the question. I said, you need, we need, I said, you need to really figure out what that is. He came back to me, like, four days later and says, said, uh, I figured out what it is. And I said, what? And he said, uh, I'm 25 years old and these people that I talk to or that I want to talk to, they're worth a lot of money and they're in their 60s and their 70s and why in the hell would they 
loan their money to me when I don't even own my own house for heaven's sake, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and I said, stop right there. I said, you're giving yourself way too much credit. Quit being conceited. No one gives a crap about you. No one gives a damn. I said, you, you could be, he's passed away now. But I said, you could be Charlie Manson. You should be able to get this money because Charlie Manson should just yell out to the warden, hey, I want to borrow some money. And the warden go, hey, Charlie, go get lost, you murder and fool. And, and he said, no, I got a, I got a $100,000 house, but I only want to borrow 50000 in the first position, and I'll give you a first lien. And if I don't pay you, uh, you'll get my $100,000 house. And the warden should loan this mass murdering guy the money. Right. So whatever your, whatever your belief is, it's the deal that sets the standard for what comes. It has nothing to do with you. Whether you speak the language, if you have a degree, you don't have a degree, if you're poor, if you're rich, it doesn't matter. Just what well, only thing that matters is what does this man get if he doesn't get paid as agreed? And that ought to change a lot of psyches right there. Now beyond that, so then once Mike rationalized that conversation, he went out to start to get money. We became partners because he learned what I had learned all along is that there's too many hats to wear in this business, and I'm going to have to, to deal with people or give up pieces of my pie all over the place anyways to get it all done. If I have someone who's a great partner, I'll take them, yeah. you know, that I think is going to be a great partner. And then we went out to find more people to share our pie with, and our pitch to those people is don't go do this on your own. Let's figure out something really fair that we can stay as a group forever because if you go out on your own, you're going to have to recreate what I'm doing right now, which is trying to find you. Or are you trying to find me? So let's just make it permanent. What you, you know, and part of that has to do with retirement plans and being able to get people to feel like they're growing with the company, you know. And so, so as soon as uh, Mike got that, he started raising money like crazy. But he came to the conclusion: there's the fighting money is a full time job, which is basically what I do as the partnership. I am in charge of making sure there's enough money. As I said, and I can't say it enough, I have 24 million on the streets right now. That's a lot of money. I still need more money. And why is that? It's, I'm selling houses on 30-year fixed notes. Now, you're talking about your banks, and one thing banks don't want to understand. So this painted me into a corner as far as having to go find private money. Banks don't want to understand wraparound mortgages. They'll loan money to a landlord where there's only one guy that gives a damn about the payment, the guy that owns the house. The landlord, right. he's the only guy that cares about that house. But they will not loan to me who wants to borrow their money and sell it on a wrap mortgage to a, another guy who buys it from me on payments. Where there's two people that care about the payment of that house, they don't want to do that. Again, I don't understand banks. Right. you got a renter who's tearing up a house inside the house. You've got an owner who sometimes put down 10, 15, 20, 30 percent down. Yeah. And they don't want to loan me money and allow me to wrap it. So yeah. I was forced to go to private people. My agreement with my lenders, they know what I'm going to do. They know I'm going to buy it for 50 and I'm going to sell it at 100 with 10,000 down and I'm going to have a note owed to me for 90 and these people are going to pay me on the 90 and I'm going to pay them on the 50. Yep. And if, and if these people don't pay me on the 90, I'm still going to pay on the 50 because they didn't loan money to the guy in my house. They loaned money to Mitch Steven and Mitch Steven pays his bill for 20 four years so far. Yep. Knock on wood. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Well, well I love the I love the principle. This, this, this leads me to the next thing now. So so you acquire the properties. Now you could so you, you're you're getting your own mortgage private money. Then you're reselling the property for, for profit, higher price, and those people are giving you a mortgage, which that creates the wrap. You're wrapping that mortgage around your mortgage. And uh we I've done that too and it works great. Um and some people would try to cheat the system and Bill, hang on one second. Um, I just oh, take your time. Okay. Um, Some people are trying to cheat the system. They are. They'll they'll get a they'll they'll get a, a regular bank mortgage and not tell them what they're doing. But you, you don't want to do that because if they find out you did that, they'll call in their note. You know, and if you if you don't have the cash, they can take the house. And, so well, they really don't would. want you know. I, I, Part of what happened was, you know, Dodd-Frank came to regulate seller financing if you were doing a certain volume, which I was certainly way the hell past that little inkling of a volume. Yeah. And so I got to know the, um, the commissioner who was head of 
regulating people like me. And um, we got we I got to know her on a first name basis because um, Dodd Frank was very hard to understand. Not even she was not clear on exactly, and we had to go figure out because I I raised my hand and said, "Look, I'm doing the hell out of what you're what you're what you're what you're supposed to monitor, and I want to do it right, and I don't know what to do. I I don't understand it. What do you guys want from me? You know." So we went and we kind of formulated it together. Well, so when we went to a lot of hearings trying to change Dodd Frank, some some you know legislators pass laws that they have no idea what they just passed. They, they have one idea. They're trying to accomplish one thing, but they just screwed up like twenty other things when they did that. You know, and they yeah. don't they don't know enough about the business. Right. So we were trying to straighten some things out, and we were had the the heads of the banking commission in the room. You know, when we were giving our testimony or talking to the, these panels. And the banks don't want these banks. In fact, they were going to make taking taking houses subject to against the law, and we stopped that in Congress. Uh, uh, and one of the parts that it, why it stopped was the bank said, "We don't want to be notified because if we notify them, then they've been put on notice, and they have to make a decision. And not making the decision might constitute that they agreed right. to let us do it." So they don't want to know, and they really don't care as long as they get the payments. And they also right. semi acknowledge that we have saved the banking system. Private investors like you and me and all those other people out there save them millions upon millions of foreclosures a year. Absolutely. Yeah. And they were like, don't mess with it. Leave it how it is. Now, here's the problem, though. And you're absolutely right. You don't want to build your fortunes or a, a, a mega business around subject two because – when the interest rates go up, if they if they ever go up, you know, which it's a matter of time, everything goes up and down, right? So once it's advantageous for them to call your notes, they may come to you, and if you have hundreds of these, you're going to get squashed. So I only do subject twos a when there's a huge discrep huge upside for me, right. huge equity that I can uh, get control of, or well, A and B, I always check to see if I have, do I have enough money to cash the amount of subject twos out that I have going right now? Right. The answer is no, I stopped doing them. And if the answer is yes, then there's a C. At the new rate that I'm going to have to pay when I borrow from my private lender, which is going to be much higher than the rates that I took over, can I still survive? Yeah. If I have to borrow the money and pay the banks off with my private money, what's the deal look like now? Do, do yep. I survive? And if the answer to those three things is yes, then I'm in. So I don't do a ton of them. Good. Okay. Well, I tell you what, we're um we're getting to the to magic half hour mark, and I know people will start to uh, change channels or stuff like that. Just point. What I want to do is, I think what you did, Miss, you just gave people a, a ton of extremely valuable information and gave them a, a a new way of looking at this in today's economy, where any, anybody can do this, anybody can produce. And if you're if you're a professional, you own a practice, for example, you're wondering what do you do now, and your your the stock market freaks you out, guys. This is this is how you can participate in a couple of different ways. You can buy properties, right, and do exactly what Mitch does, and resell them, or whatever you whatever you want to do, take money out of the stock market and be be a lender, right? Be the lender that Mitch is using. So in any case, uh, I think if you're paying attention, you just got some gold nuggets. But Mitch, Mitch. Some of these folks are never going to want to reach out to you and get your book and figure out, well, I need more information. Professional people understand you got to have the right education. Actually, we talked about that earlier, the right education, the right information, right action steps. So how can people uh, work with you, um, get your information, get, you know, that, I don't know if you teach people, uh, but share a little bit about that while we got some time here, if you don't mind. You, know? you can learn just about anything and everything you want to know about me and get my books, get, see the courses, see the mentorships. Learn about raising a loan and private money if that's what you want to do. Learn about that program. Just go to 1000houses.com. That's 1000houses.com. Or call me personally. If you're interested in lending money and want to have a conversation and want to meet some of the lenders that have been lending me money for a decade, a decade and a half, two decades um, through the recession, you know, I've never given a house back. I've never filed bankruptcy. I've never been in foreclosure. Again, right. knock on wood, but also I set parameters, man. I never borrow over 65% of the owner finance value. So I'm, I've been policing myself for years, for decades. Um, my phone number is 
669-4020. And if you want to talk about private money, give me a buzz. If you want to review all the other stuff I have available, I have three books, uh, mentorships, uh, podcasts. It's all there, 1000houses.com. 1000houses.com. Well, I tell you what, bitch, I appreciate you taking your valuable time to do this. And everybody listening, uh, God bless you and your families. We'll see you on next week's podcast. Remember, go ahead and subscribe. Whatever channel you listen to this on, just subscribe to it. And also go to realestatewithdarywilson.com and uh, you know, go to members area. Click on the right-hand side if you're not currently a member and check it out. And right now, they're giving you pretty much access to everything for free for a month. So, but also go to 1000houses.com and check out definitely what Mitch has got to offer because right now it's no more better timely time to be doing this kind of stuff. So uh, you guys take care of Mitch. You t God bless you too. You take care of your family. Enjoy your time on the ranch, man. And uh, we'll, we'll see you next time. All right, man. I appreciate it, Gary. Thanks for having me on. You're welcome. Thanks for listening to this episode of Massive Passive Cash Flow. Be sure to go to realestatewithgarywilson.com to join our community and start building wealth today.